for heroes proved in liberating strife who more than self their country loved first lesson that black people had to navigate in this country was that voting uh, is dangerous. Voting is going to be met with violent resistance, particularly in regions where there are enough black people to actually have impacts on outcomes. Brian Stevenson is the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, which created the National Memorial. Throughout that hundred year history, between the end of Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement, um, the inability to vote is what shaped black life. The memorial is informally known as the National Lynching Museum, and it's filled with thousands of names of black Americans, many of them killed amid the push for voting rights.
the violence that takes place, the trauma that takes place, the lynching that takes place, the mass migration of black people from the deep south to the north and the west that takes place, which will also have political implications, uh, is all a result of this violent opposition to allowing black people to vote. The violence was combined with other things, poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, to prevent black people from voting in the Jim Crow South. The long struggle came to a head in 1965 with the march from Selma to Montgomery, which the future Congressman John Lewis helped organize. We are marching today to dramatize to the nation, dramatize to the world, that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens denied the right to vote. You are ordered to disperse. This march will not continue. It became known as Bloody Sunday. The violence was broadcast into living rooms across the country, arousing the national conscience in the same way that images of George Floyd's death would 55 years later. Within months, it led to the signing of the Voting Rights Act. The law barred voting discrimination and originally targeted seven southern states that had a pattern of disenfranchisement. It required them to get federal approval for any voting law changes. That provision was called Section 5. It says that any time the laws were changed that dealing with voting, they had to first be submitted to the Attorney General of the United States are submitted to a three-judge district court in Washington, D.C. So Section 5 was a very powerful tool uh, to keep uh, those in power from uh, suppressing the right to vote. Hank Sanders was elected state senator in Alabama thanks to the Voting Rights Act. All of a sudden, the possibility of inclusion began to just grow. and. It took many years, though, before um, you had a substantial amount of African Americans elected to office. Within a year of its passage, a quarter of a million African Americans had registered to vote. By 1968, 385 black people had been elected to office across the South. By 1985, that number would grow to nearly 4,000. But by then, there was also a growing backlash that would give rise to new challenges and place new obstacles in front of black voters. When you don't want somebody to vote, you create various kinds of things. Now we'd come with the 1965 Voting Rights Act, they couldn't deny it outright, so you find ways to try to suppress it. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Antonio Williams. Um, I served 14 years and two weeks in the Minnesota Department of Corrections. I have been home two and a half years. Every election cycle, I have worked on a campaign. I have worked on Mary Moriarty's campaign. I have worked on Keith Ellison's campaign. I have worked on um, Robin Wansley's campaign and more and more. Um, and I have also led voter engagement voter turnout uh, initiatives. I have been welcomed back into community by community, but I'm not welcomed back into my community fully by my state, by my country, because I'm not fully included in our democracy. What I know about inclusion is that it restores more than just the power to choose representation it restores dignity, it restores hope. Without full participation in our democracy, we are seeing people who say, this isn't mine, so why should I care? Why do I have an interest in being a productive member of society if I have to pay taxes, but I can't choose my representation? And so what this bill does is it restores hope, it restores dignity, and it says, 
I have a community who recognizes my worth and my value and that when I'm better, my community is better and my community sees that. I urge everyone here to support this because it is not about just voting. It is about making sure that we are full and we are whole again. Thank you. I'm Willie Lord. Um, good morning, Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. I am honored to have the opportunity to talk to you about um, HF 28 and how the absence of such a bill has adversely impacted my life. I sit here before you as someone who has been formally impacted by the criminal justice system. But in spite of that, I've been an American my whole life. And just like some of you, I'm a spouse, a husband, a proud father of a 14-year-old daughter. And like some of you, I'm a businessman, a homeowner, a mentor, philanthropist, and I just so happen to be fortunate to uh, work in the most noblest profession, and that is of a teacher. I've been teaching now for over 12 years. Over 5,000 students have came through my classroom. I am a leader in my community. But unlike you, I don't have a voice. Unlike you, I've been made to feel like a second-class American because I can't vote. I humbly request and ask that you bring your full weight and might behind HF 28. Because as we all know, in America, there's nothing more un-American than taxation with our representation. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Shane Price. People call me Brother Shane Price. Uh, I represent the Power of People Leadership Institute. We do three things. We do prevention for girls and boys. We do intervention for men. I work in the intervention area. I have been teaching and training in Minnesota State Correctional Facilities for over 18 years. I have one of the strongest records of success that there is. Some of my successful students are in this room right now. I think that the work that we do has helped promote safety in the state of Minnesota. But something about this bill that I support has been working me, working me in a way I couldn't understand. I attended a community meeting at Sabathony Community Center. Some of the uh, representatives were at that meeting and talked about supporting the bill. But later, had a change of heart. So I'm used to speaking to, in my work, police, corrections officers, lawyers. I'm used to straight talk. We don't have to totally agree on everything, but we do have to talk straight, and I like that. But the, this particular committee member elected to change his vote, which is his right, when he got to voting time. And this is what he said. He said, I can't forget about the victims. And all the bells in me went off because that is what has been working me about this particular bill. Because those victims who tried to vote many years ago but couldn't were hung and maimed and brutalized. This is an opportunity to rectify, to restore, means to go back and fix it, to restore not just the rights of those individuals who are here today, not just the rights of those who will uh, uh, have the uh, privilege of voting in the future, but to go back and rectify, to restore some of the wrong that has been done in the past. This is why this bill is so powerful to me. And this is why I think Minnesota has the opportunity to be on the right side of history. Uh, I would support, I would respectfully ask you to support this bill and thank you so much for your time this morning. I'm hoping that these celebrations will become moments that we look back on as 
these wonderful opportunities to be able to move some change in our communities now. And so within literally months of getting out, I'm door knocking, trying to convince people to use their power to vote, to, to, to convince them to, to use electoral power, the power of the ballot, and yet I couldn't vote. And so year in after year in after year in, I stayed engaged in politics, and yet I could never hold that little red stick that said I voted. I could never do it until now. Let's start with the assassination of President Lincoln, leading to the Andrew Johnson presidency. Johnson, a firm believer in state rights, allowed states post-Civil War to reestablish their own governments. Southern states, free from restraint, drafted their own laws that actively targeted the rights and freedoms of African Americans. To combat these oppressive laws, Congress passed the 14th and 15th Amendments. Now former slaves were granted citizenship, and states were prohibited from denying voting rights based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. But the states simply worked around the amendments with new suppression tactics, ushering in the era of the Jim Crow laws. The poll taxes, literacy tests, legalized segregation. These state and local laws not only suppressed the vote, they made daily life for African Americans dangerous. The price for resistance was fierce. Meanwhile, on the federal level, the 19th Amendment extended voting rights to women, sort of, because Jim Crow laws still practically denied African American women the right to vote. Almost a century after the birth of Jim Crow laws, finally, a victory, with the passing of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. A year later, the Supreme Court bans the poll tax. The era of Jim Crow is dead, but the era of black voter suppression is not. In 2012, Black voter turnout rate exceeded white voter turnout for the first time in U.S. history, leading to the re-election of President Obama. We are an American family and we rise or fall together as one nation and as one people. But only a year later, the Supreme Court decided to overturn a key aspect of the Voting Rights Act. Some states no longer need federal approval to change their election laws. A few short years later, we're living in a new but familiar world of threats to voters' rights. These tactics can make people feel their vote doesn't matter. But history teaches us not just about these challenges, but how we overcame them. And why we have an obligation to fulfill the rights that others fought so hard to enable and protect. <laughs>